are so excited to have this panel. It's a topic that's uh, very close to those uh, in the Valley, especially who are of Portuguese background. Um, and um, uh, first of all, welcome to all of you who are here, participants on the webinar, and welcome to those of you who are following us on uh, Facebook Live, and those of you who will be seeing us later on uh, our PBBI YouTube channel. Um, we also want to, as always, thank the Luso American Development Foundation, one of our sponsors from Portugal, our major sponsor, uh, for being uh, uh, a very important sponsor. And of course, um, with uh, FLAD's help, we are able to do many of the things that uh, PBBI does on a basically uh, on a daily basis here uh, to promote the uh, presence of the Portuguese American legacy in the Central Valley and throughout the entire state of California. Our panel today is called Portuguese Americans in the Valley, uh, agricultural, uh, in, in Valley agriculture, I should say, uh, tradition and innovation. And uh, just a little bit before we, we uh, introduce the panelists and they talk a little bit about themselves and some of the topics we'll be discussing, uh, I thought it'd be uh, just for our information uh, to look at, you know, the Portuguese presence in California and how long we've been at, at this. You know, we have um, a, a strong presence in uh, all parts of the state, but in, in here in the Valley in agriculture. And just to let you know that, for example, in 1870, uh, according to that census, there were 3,435 uh, Californians who were of Portuguese background. That number from 1870 increased to 15,580 by 1900. So in just that 30 uh, a year span, you see how many people came from uh, mainly from the Azores. And, and so that's where you have lots of people who are third, fourth, and even fifth generation whose uh, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents came at that time. Um, and then by 1930, that was the next time we had a census, there were 99,194, so about 100,000 people that, grow, that grew immensely between 1900 and 1930, most of that between 19 and 1921, because then the immigration law of 21 decreased our numbers drastically. And then from 1930 to 1960, it actually decreased from 99,000 to 97. So a few people died and uh, not many came in, uh, in uh, that 30 year time span. But then between 1960 and the year 2000, which is the last kind of true numbers we have, it went from 97,000 to 358,000. So that was the last uh, exit of immigrants that came uh, like in uh, 1960, all the way up until about 1980 or so. And, uh, and so, and our presence in, in the Valley, in the San Joaquin Valley has been, uh, you know, constant since uh, the late 1870s as it shows there by the numbers. And so our involvement in uh, such a vital industry is agriculture. So we're gonna start with, uh, first of all, thanks to all three of you for joining us. Um, thank you, Mel, Michael, and Linda. And if we, uh, if you don't mind, we'll start with you kind of introducing yourselves. You can do a much better job than I can. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your connection to the Portuguese world, to the Portuguese American world. Um, and a little bit about your, uh, your uh, trajectory, your uh, into agriculture, into what you're doing now. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Machado, if you don't mind, um, leading us off. Okay, I'm Mel Machado. I'm the Vice President of Member Relations for Blue Diamond Growers. Uh, Blue Diamond's the uh, largest tree nut handler in the world, and we're the, the biggest handler in the California almond industry. I grew up on a grade B dairy that doesn't exist anymore, and grade Bs aren't out there. 35 cows, flat barn, the old wooden barn. Uh, the barn was, or the dairy was too small for both of us, and uh, I hopped on my bicycle, which was my father's bicycle when he was a kid, and I went up to, uh, the road to work for a neighbor a gentleman by the name of Joe Avernaz, and anybody around Merced County remembers the guy they called Sweet Potato Joe. So I worked for him and, and went to work in the fields when I was 14. Uh, graduated from Fresno State in 79, uh, figured I was going to wind up in Salinas Valley because my background is actually vegetables, oddly enough. Uh, was asked to come back to Merced College where I got my associate degree and uh, ran their farming operation. The college at the time had a 250-acre farming operation. And I always said there was 18 different crops, and thank God not all at one time. But uh, ran that, taught plant science and some ag business in the night program for about 13 years. And then uh, saw an opportunity to get back in the private sector. Been at Blue Diamond for 28 years now. Came in as a field rep uh, working in San Jose and San Joaquin counties and have moved up. And I've, I've peaked now, I'm a VP role. So this is the end of the road for me. 
Well, first of all, congratulations. That's uh, quite a um, quite a, a, an achievement, uh, and, uh, and 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 all of your years in education as well. Thank you for your service there as well. And um, and, and the Portuguese connection, um, uh, which uh, family immigrated? Um, you recall on both sides. Yeah, both sides. My, okay. My grandmother's parents were born in the Azores. My father's parents were born in the Merced County in the Buhack area. Uh, which, you know, only Portuguese people know where Buhack is. Nobody else knows where Buhack is. That's right. Uh, Buhack Road 99, yeah, the basic intersection. Uh, the background's from uh, Flores and Corvo. Flores and Corvo. Which, which I've never been there. I actually, I've been trying for five years to go, and each year there's a stumbling block. This year we had the tickets bought and COVID hit. So I'm, well, I'm looking to go back because my, my, my um, maternal uh, parents or grandparents were Manaz, M-A-N-H-A. I don't know of any Manaz. There was one who was in the police department in Fresno years ago. Uh, all the ones a, that I know of are gone. So if I find the Manaz, I figure that's blood. That is, that is, that's a unique yeah. name. That's a unique yeah. name. There's a few, but not very many throughout the Azores. Yeah. And you have that, um, and and with the family from from Corvo, well, that's the smallest side in the archipelago. 400 people, there's gotta be a lot of relatives still there, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm told I better go before they close it. <laughs> <laughs> We, I don't think people in court would like to hear that, but that's a strong possibility as the world changes. You're so right, Mel. Uh, and so thank you so much, Mel. And we'll uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Linda. Linda, a little bit of an introduction about yourself. Some Lots of people know who Linda Souza Pajeda is, but a little bit about yourself and uh, your trajectory to where you are in, uh, in banking in the ag uh, industry and also uh, your Portuguese connection as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, Linda Souza Pajeda, and um, basically I'm a first generation Portuguese American. Um, my parents didn't immigrate here until 1979. So basically on the latter end of the diaspora, uh, as you would call it. And, um, you know, my dad, so both my parents are from St. George, um, Frexias of Tulp and Saint Antoine. Um, my parents were married in the Azores. Um, my dad fought in the in the Portuguese army in Africa. And uh, basically after that, they immigrated here um, in 1979, um, specifically to the Turlock area. So um, that's where I'm from originally, um, grew up there. And um, I will say that Portuguese was my first language. Um, I started elementary school and, and didn't know any English. Uh, so that was a fun adventure, but growing up, I think in a rural area um, that was ma majority uh, Portuguese based, um, you know, we obviously had a teacher's aide um, starting in kindergarten that helped um, kind of all of us immigrant uh, kids out in, in learning English. And so from there, I, I grew up in the Turlock area, um, went to college at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, I earned a bachelor's degree in, in ag business um, and a minor in dairy science. And um, from there, I moved to Bakersfield for a few years. And then um, I've lived in Tulare um, for several years. Um, after college, I, I went into um, ag banking. So I worked for a large commercial bank um, for four years. And um, the last six years, um, I've been a loan officer um, with a uh, ag lender in the farm credit system here locally in Tulare. Great, fantastic. And, uh, uh, and uh, so you are, uh, we have uh, 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 Mr. Machado, whose grandparents immigrated from one side of the family. They were born here. Now you uh, basically, you, uh, first generation born uh, from your parents. And you're right, you, your parents in 1979 were kind of the last of the Mohicans, as we would call them, the last of the immigrants, because uh, it kind of phased out at the end of 1980, 81, 82. Uh, there right. was no immigration after that. Uh, and then now to Mr. Michael Pajeda. Michael. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my mom and dad is Joe and Fatima Pereira. Uh, my dad, I think, immigrated here in 1966. He was 13. Uh, he somehow graduates high school, ends up in the Azores, and meets my mom one summer. And then I believe in 1974 or 75, she somehow ends up here in the United States following my dad back to get married which is very odd because my dad must be some kind of stud in order to do something like that. 
So, uh, so then, you know, obviously I was born and then uh, I went, I didn't want anything to do with cows when I was a little kid. I didn't want anything to do with ag, anything. I played baseball pretty much my whole life. I thought that's where I was going to end up getting drafted out of high school. So I played baseball for, uh, uh, for two years at a JC. I hurt my arm and obviously no one wanted to talk to me anymore after my arm got messed up. So I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do? So I was like, well, I guess I'm getting into the cow deal. So uh, I went to COS, got a, uh, I got my, uh, I think I got my AS degree there. And then I went to Cal Poly and I became a, uh, I got my uh, dairy science, bachelor's of dairy science. And that took about 12 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, then I went and I worked for uh, Monsanto, which I have to say was a great learning. Um, it was a great learning process for me because, um, you know, they're a huge corporation and uh, they understand how to, uh, how to train people. But I soon realized that the corporate life kind of wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to kind of do things on my own. I, I like thinking outside the box a lot, which uh, corporate... <laughs> Corporations sometimes don't like people that do that. And I started my own uh, AI business called Pereira's Breeding Service. And uh, I, 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 I don't breed as much as I did when I first started. I do a lot more consulting and selling now, which has uh, been really good for me. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. You know, my friends at Fresno State are going to say, how did we... Uh, end up with a panel with two Cal Poly graduates <laughs> and only one Fresno State graduate. But that's only to show you that, uh, you know, we are not biased. We will, uh, we will we'll have panels with folks who are uh, in uh, agriculture and uh, dairy industry, um, regardless if they come from Fresno State or, or from Cal Poly. Um, and, uh, and by the way, you forgot one important thing, Michael, and that's your awesome golfer. You forgot about that part. Yeah, I'm not not too bad. Uh, once you get to play with the guys that are really good, some of the pros that you see on TV, then you realize uh, you're really not that good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure you still are. Um, so let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your your particular industries that you're involved in, um, and we'll we'll go we'll go back to Mr. Machado again. And uh, so, uh, how is the uh, how is basically uh, your kind of industry now doing uh, in these times? Um, as you said, you're the largest in the world. Um, and so um, how has that processed? Because that wasn't always the case, of course, in the valley. The valley wasn't, uh, I mean, there's always been trees in the valley, obviously. Yeah. But uh, it, it, this avalanche towards uh, tr planting these trees, you know, for walnuts uh, and, and different other um, uh, pistachios, etc. Um, that's something that took off not in the too distant past. So tell us a little bit about that history and how your company evolved, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, the almond industry has been, a, I'm gonna, I call it a fairly recent innovation. Blue Diamond's 110 years old. So mm -hmm. there have been almonds planted here for a long, long time. But I remember in, in the, uh, the 60s and 70s, people said there's too many almond trees in the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, my first crop at Blue Diamond was in 92, and it was 520 million pounds on 365,000 acres. This year's crop is 3 billion pounds on 1.25 million acres. So we've grown pretty dramatically as an industry. And it's because, you know, with 400 crops grown in the valley, almonds have been pretty good. We, we've got cycles. I tell people that if you, if you track the pricing cycle, it's kind of like the image of the Golden Gate. You got high prices that are peaks and you got the lows in between. And those lows tend to be three to five years long. We're going into a low right now. Uh, Almond prices on the 19 crop averaged about 255 a pound. Uh, quite frankly, I'm telling people don't budget more than $1.50 a pound on the 20 crop. And, and it's because the, the acreage demographic is quite striking. If I could show you all the graphics and the slides I've got, it, it becomes pretty clear. A third of the bearing acreage that we have in the ground right now, and they start producing in year three, but a third of the bearing acreage is between fourth and seventh leaf. In other words, that stuff's going to have a bigger crop because it had a birthday. Hmm. For, for uh, Linda there in the ag banking world, that's our reality. Yeah. Uh, the bloom almost isn't going to matter. You know, and bloom always matters, but 
we're seeing production increase on a, a gross industry level, no matter what the yield per acre is. Uh, the last 10 year average yield is about 2,172 pounds. This crop is 2,400. Even if we go back to the 10 year average, we'll be at about 2.85 billion pounds next year because there's so many acres coming online. Uh, that's putting pressure on prices. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a lot of faith in this almond industry. I, myself, my wife and I uh, have a little block. My wife is uh, an unusual person in that she's the business manager for the ex-husband and father-in-law's farming operation. They have 700 acres that they take care of, plus a sheller. Her and I went out and bought you know 19 measly acres that I've got planted. Uh, and I pulled out walnuts. And my neighbor said, why did you pull out walnuts? Because I have more faith in the almond industry than I do in the walnut industry. I know what we're capable of. And we, we function under a, a health halo, a heart health halo, that will help us get through things much easier, much more quickly than other crops will. Uh, and that's, that's been very attractive to a lot of farmers. We've got people pulling out cows and planting trees around the valley. Just very close to where I live. That's just that's happening yeah. right now. Yeah. And so, that's, I was going to ask you, and and so uh, you do you see that trend? Continue? Yeah. The only thing that's going to limit us is water. Uh, we still to this day do not fully understand the implications of Sigma, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It will play a role. The only thing I can say is, for those of us that have water, life will be good. For those that don't, life's not going to be so much fun. Uh, people naturally think about the Westlands. Uh, and Kern County. Kern County has the water bank and even the little bit that still dribbles through the front Kern Canal with, with their uh, subsidence issues, and they'll get that fixed. I'm more concerned about Western Fresno, and Western Madera County right now. Uh, oh. For those people, it could be tough under Sigma. We keep hearing that the sustainable yield is about six inches, but nobody knows for sure. Uh, before Sigma, if we get into another drought situation, That'll have some immediate impacts on the 2021 and 2022 crop. And then if we do get in a drought situation, I have no doubt that the legislature will step in and try to speed up Sigma. We, uh, you know, sometimes when we, and because we have some folks following us from different parts of, of the country as well, um, just recently we had an election and we had, you know, quite a few Portuguese Americans running for water boards. Mm -hmm. And when you tell that some people in the East Coast, they say, why would anybody run for a water board? What's a water board? Can you kind of explain a little bit that, you know, it is a, a powerful entity and an important entity for, for agriculture uh, in the Valley, is it not? I'm somewhat entertained because there's actually been people who have questioned, uh, they say it's a conflict of interest for farmers to be on irrigation district boards. My reaction is, hello, it's called an irrigation district for a reason. Uh, and farmers need to get involved. And, and we've had cases here locally in Modesto with a Modesto irrigation district where people who are not directly tied to agriculture, they're rate payers for power because MID provides electrical power. Uh, they're not tied to ag and they have a different point of view than, than the, the farmers do who have had very favorable water prices here in this district and ample supplies. Hmm. So it's important for, for growers to be involved in their local districts. Very important. Okay. So it is important to have all those uh, different Portuguese names, especially, I mean, any ethnicity, but we see a lot of Portuguese names in the water boards because yep. of their involvement in agriculture. Yes. And Michael, a little bit about the uh, the dairy industry. So you you started, as you said, with a big corporation. You transitioned over to your own company, um, doing lots of consulting. How do you see the dairy business from the time that you didn't like cows at all? Uh, but I mean, from the time you got you know kind of involved after college, uh, how do you see, you know, Mr. Machado just talked, to, talked a little bit about, you know, some of the evolution that's happened, you know, in the almond industry, for example. Uh, how do you see the dairy industry uh, and its evolution in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years or so, Michael? Well, the one thing is we, a lot of people don't give credit to the farmers is that they are very intelligent people, whether it's almond farmers or dairy farmers. They figure out a way to get things done. Even with all the laws that are put in place, they do a great job of being efficient and i think that's what we've seen from the 1980s till now is the the tremendous efficiency that people put into the dairies and the actual which we don't advertise enough is how awesome the a, a lot of these guys do taking care of their animals and animal comfort and and the fact that we're producing a healthy product that Sometimes when you look on the internet or, or on the news or whatever, and they say, you know, talk a lot of bad stuff, which is not the case. Uh, so these dairymen have become super efficient. The only thing 
uh, and I don't know if you consider this a negative or not, is that these guys are going to, the bigger guys are going to get bigger and they're probably going to, the smaller guys are probably going to whittle away. Uh, it's just, but Michael, that that's been happening for a while, or is it because I've heard about that? You know, like you know, fifteen years ago, people would say, "Oh, the little guys are going to disappear." You think yeah. that's there's a tendency to continue? Uh, yes, because unless they have their own little market, whether it's uh, selling, um, you know, uh, their own milk to, like for example, uh, top of the morn here, they sell. They actually, I get every Thursday morning, I get sh uh, milk shipped to my front of my door, which is awesome. Uh, but the guys that don't have their little niche markets, mm -hmm. it's going to be super hard because of the efficiency, uh, the cost of production and the efficiency that these people have, that these dairies have compared to the smaller dairies. I mean, first of all, the larger dairies, and, and this is in a whole, this is, uh, this is the majority, uh, or I don't want to say that it's every large farmer, but for the efficient ones, they do a better job taking care of their animals. Uh, they're able to, to, to lower their, their production costs. Uh, the cows are normally, I think, taken care of a little bit better. I'm gonna get some, a lot of stuff for this, but I, I just think that overall these, these dairies that are a little bit bigger, they have the sources in order to make the animal more comfortable and produce more milk and have a healthy animal. For example, right now, the state of California, they have a uh, methane digester deal going on. So a lot of these, they're not going to, you know, they're not taking uh, small dairies for methane digest, for the methane digester. So these large dairies, they're going to be converting their manure, the methane into, uh, into gas and putting it directly into our pipeline. So that just shows you you know, the amount of effort that these dairymen are doing in order to help the, uh, to help the environment. Uh, and if I, I could be wrong, but I think methane gas that the cows produce is one of the best natural gases you can actually use for energy. So these dairymen are collecting this energy and they're probably going to get paid more for it than they would for their milk. And that just shows you the evolution of the dairy business and how smart these people are. Um, you know, you talk to city people and they always want to, you know, you always hear jokes about farmers, but these guys are extremely intelligent and they know how to be efficient and how to, and, and how to run, uh, you know, how to make a safe and, uh, and healthy product for us to consume. And what, um, when you talk about a small dairy versus a, a large dairy, what, what kind of, what numbers are we talking about? So for because I mean that's different than when, for example, when your father came over in 1960s, no, I know. So which a large dairy was like 400 cows, you know. You know, like if, I think if you've got over a thousand cows, you know, 1,200 cows or so, you'll be fine. Uh, but these guys that start getting into the two, four, you know, 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 cow dairies, their cost of production is just so much better, and and they're just able to do a lot more. Okay. And Linda, you, I don't know if I'm saying anything dumb, but you can. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, yeah. Basically the average size dairy for the Central Valley is around 1400 cows. Um, so, you know, we've seen that evolve, right? From where you could have a 200, 400 cow dairy to now you're looking at an average of at least 1400. Um, so I think that's totally accurate. And we are going to keep seeing the consolidations um, happen. It's just, you know, a matter of the economies of scale. And since we, we've transitioned to you, Linda, uh, so tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the banking uh, industry when it comes to uh, agriculture and to the dairy industry. So how, how have you seen some changes? Because it's something that you've been doing for a while, uh, you know, like you said, with, a, you know, a, a kind of a, a product for all bank first and now something a little bit more specific to the dairy industry. So how have you seen the, the, the changes um, in, in your field? And, and sometimes it's interesting because, you know, uh, I think Michael touched upon you know, a, a point there uh, when you said, you know, some, that there's, uh, and even Mr. Machado as well, when we talked about the water. Um, and, and 
there are sometimes misconceptions, you know, um, with someone who sure. doesn't live in a more of a rural area, you know, or even even a large city like Fresno, but, you know, you're surrounded by rural areas, you know. So when you don't have that touch with the r rural areas of whether it be in a valley or other parts uh, of the United States, but let's talk about our valley, people kind of, you know, think, you know, well, um, everybody just goes to bank X, Y, and Z, you know, whether they are a farmer or a police officer or whatever. But but uh, there are specific products. There are specific. There are spe specific rules and regulations to the dairy and the, and the ag business. And so let's talk a little bit about how your type of banking is different than you know going to you know our local bank and depositing our check. Sure. Okay. So that's a, a complicated question, I guess. But um, <laughs> I've definitely seen the industry evolve. Um, so basically, like my parents, like most immigrants, they started working on dairies. Um, when they arrived here. So, um, and that's what my dad did. My dad milked cows for, for a few years and basically started a dairy of his own in the nineties, um, which at that point was a couple hundred cows and, you know, everybody in the family had to work. Right. And so, um, and that's kind of what you did. Right. And, and in, at that time, milking cows was profitable. Right. And so then you, you know, you hit the downturns of 2008, 2009, um, which really changed the industry. A lot of those small, you know, a lot of Portuguese dairies had to exit the industry. Um, they just didn't have the tools, you know, to survive that kind of impact. And so, um, you know, I feel like the, the business changed at that point. Right. Um, it, it's just a, it's a different model now. The, the dairy industry is just a lot more volatile than it used to be. So, so basically you saw a lot of those smaller dairies exiting at that point, um, you know, and kind of up to what it is now, right? You're, you're looking at at least, you know, 13, 1400 cow dairies. Um, I think, you know, the ones that have farm ground and are, and are able to farm um, for their needs, I think that's going to be a key thing going forward, uh, especially with this water situation and with Sigma. Um, you know, that may kind of impact, you know, uh, silage and forage prices um, in the future. So if you're able to grow what you need for your dairy, that that's already, you know, very important. Um, I think there's been a lot of technological improvements in the industry. Um, you know, the, the industry itself is very environmentally uh, sustainable, right? So from solar to methane digesters, um, we're basically recycling water, we're, you know, methane, this and that, right? So um, kind of one of the unique industries in ag, um, I would say. And uh, so I think that's kind of the future of where it's headed, right? Um, you know, as technology kind of improves, um, I think you have to kind of improve with it, right? And so um, some of these dairies that are kind of stuck in the mentality that they were 20 years ago, right? Or they haven't made any improvements or invested anything back into the operation, I, I think they're going to have a hard time um, surviving uh, for what's to come. And uh, I, I guess in banking, you know, we, we've seen a, a, a kind of a lot of that change where it's, you know, there are some people that, that want to improve and take those next, next steps and some that are kind of stuck in their ways. Um, so to speak. So it, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I think there'll be, will be a lot more consolidations. And, and obviously that, that average dairy size, I think is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and you're going to see less entities, you know, operating. So less, less, uh, less dairies, but not necessarily less cows. Absolutely. Yeah. The cow number just keeps increasing, you know, but, but definitely less number of entities, I think. Okay. So, yeah. And we're getting to the point too now where a lot of these dairymen are device, diversifying and they don't they don't really want to get bigger. So where we're actually calculating out how many heifers or how many replacements they need in a year. And before in the 2000s, you know, the more the more replacements you had, the more you can bring in, uh, the bigger the dairy can get, right? Oh, okay, we'll expand or do what to build more pens. Well, that's not what's going on anymore. Now they want the exact number of animals that they're going to have that year. So uh, like, for example, semen companies have a product that makes 90% 90, 90 females. 
Uh, so if I breed a cow, it's a chance, a chance she's going to have, and she gets pregnant, it's a chance she's going to, uh, the female, it's a 90% 90, 90 chance she's going to have a female. So what we do is we use that, and then we counteract the extra with beef. So we have a terminal cross that we read with the Holstein, and which brings in even more money in, uh, for the dairyman uh, uh, with the actual beef uh, Holstein cross. Interesting. Very interesting. And uh, so that's the uh, that's technology at work. I mean, yeah. really, uh, indeed. And Mr. Machado, a little bit about um, one aspect um, that, uh, you know, when we're talking about something that Michael mentioned, uh, you know, and even Linda, you know, how sometimes there are some uh, misconceptions as far as how uh, environmental friendly, you know, farmers and dairymen in general are. And one of the things, of course, we hear about trees, as you know, is, you know, they take up too much water, they're oh, yeah. going to, you know, uh, ruin everything. So uh, give us a little bit of a, 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 of an enlightenment in that aspect, please. That's a, you hit right in the middle of the world I live in. Um, I'm unique because of my background running that, that school farming operation. I've grown 20 different crops, uh, grown in Merced County, with the exception of winter grains like wheat, barley, oats, winter forage. They all used down there three to three and a half feet of water. Didn't matter what I was growing. And the worst one was, uh, weirdly, bell peppers grown for seed. They take a lot of water. Uh, but we fight that. In the almond industry, we've got this thing about using too much water, and it's a gallon per kernel. I will say a lot of growers were in denial about it. I had to hold quite a few growers' hands and say, do the math. It's 0.8 to 1.1 gallons, depending on the variety and your yield. That being said, uh, the, the thing we get into is people in the general population have lost their connection to agriculture. And it's something that we all face, no matter what crop you're producing. Uh, one of the things I, I like to do is when I get to speak to a non-ag crowd, I will ask for a show of hands, who in the room has direct contact with, with production ag? I occasionally have to explain, I mean, you live or work on a farm. I'll have, depending on where I'm at, from two to 10% of the room. Okay, whose parents had direct contact with production ag? Now I got maybe half the room. By the time I get to grandparents, I'll usually have most, if not all of the room. The problem is it is the success of agriculture in this country, and particularly in California, that allows people to be bankers, doctors, lawyers, truckers, to do whatever. They no longer have to toil daily in the production of their food. But that disconnect manifests itself in legislation and regulation. So people don't understand it. And then us in ag have to deal with it. Uh, I'm fully involved in the sustainability movement in the almond industry. And I hate the word, okay, because there's so many definitions depending on the person who's talking. Uh, and I, I would much rather pivot that and, and talk about stewardship, because we could all agree that farmers are good stewards of the land. This, this tie of the legacy of the land and family is so critical to everybody in production ag, but the people that are outside don't see that. Uh, I do a lot of customer tours. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking big customers, the big multinational food companies that I get to take out in the fields. And when I'm done in every case, their reaction is, oh, I didn't know that. You're right, that's why you're here. But they had preconceived ideas coming in into the field that we have to combat. And if we don't get them out in the field, and get a chance to talk to them and show them actually what's going on, then that's an uphill battle. And I, yeah. I encourage farmers, bring people onto your field, bring them onto your ranch, bring them onto your dairy, you know, invite people in, be a good spokesman for the industry. So one of the best ways is actually to be yourself a spokesman, even though, you know, you're busy trying to, you know, uh, make the farming or the dairy operation work, but sometimes you have to go a little bit over and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, I understand you're busy. A lot of people want to pay their Farm Bureau dues or, or, or whatever organization they belong to and expect somebody else to carry that weight for them. No, you, you've got to help carry that weight. You, you've, got to, you've got to go to Sacramento. You've got to walk the halls in the Capitol yourself. Mm -hmm. okay? My fantasy is to have people walking, farmers walking the halls every day that they're in session up there. And, and the words I want to use is, I'm not your constituent. You know, talking to, to representatives in the city, I'm not your constituent, but your constituents depend on what I produce. Therefore, we have a link. So you we feel it's important that the farmers contact not only with their legislators, but all the legislators. Absolutely. And invite them and their staff to your operations. Open up a line of communication. Now, in in, in the almond industry and in ag in general, how important uh, 
from your perspective are, uh, you know, of course, the production for, con for to consume here in the States, but how important is the global market <clears throat> nowadays? Because everything seems like uh, everything is, a, is looked at from a global, you know, aspect. I had a, a, a friend of mine the other day that said, you know, you got to uh, be local, but think global. And yeah. so um, is that uh, more and more something in the agriculture industry in, in almonds and, and, and everywhere else? In almonds in particular, yes. We export about 70% of the crop. Interesting. So yeah, it, it's a huge, huge thing. I like the, the COVID implications. COVID messed with supply chains here in the U.S. It changed the way people purchased. Um, a lot of consumers don't know when, when you are at the uh, the cash register and they scan that product across that little laser beam, you're thinking that's so that the check guy doesn't have to uh, remember what the prices are. No, there's data collected from that. And we're able to track grocery store purchases daily. And what we found is here domestically, people were going to the store less often, but buying more. Hmm. In our case, they weren't purchasing the six ounce can, they're buying the two pound bag, hmm. okay? Uh, in export, India shut the country down. They literally shut the country down and it's six weeks to get a container from Oakland to India. When they got there, or when, when they get there rather, they don't necessarily pull them off of the boat like we put them on here with the big cranes that you see at the docks. They might pull that, that container off, but it might not wind up on a chassis and get driven somewhere. There might be a bunch of guys that are schlepping those sacks of nuts out of that box by hand. Well, they sent the people home, and some of those people live hundreds of miles away, and they shut down everything. And after about two weeks, they discovered, whoa, we need to get this commerce going, this supply chain going. So it disrupted the chain of commerce in India in particular for a couple months until they could rebuild that infrastructure they had, literally physically moving bags by hand. Okay. So yeah, and ag, I mean, the dairy industry also is dependent on exports. There's nothing in California that doesn't depend on exports. So it's a big part of uh, the business today, yeah. independently. And, uh, and and Michael, do you do you see that? Do, do do dairymen, some of the ones that you consult with, do they um, do they also you know feel that uh, the weight of exports, how important those are, you know that uh, that what they're producing, you know, might end up in a product somewhere, you know, in Asia or uh, or in other parts of the world. How important is that to the dairy industry from your perspective? And how do how do dairy people look at that? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't. I don't know that answer. That's not my forte when it comes to dairy stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I deal mostly with genetics and uh, and uh, and uh, and cow cow comfort type stuff. So that's beyond my area of expertise. That's uh, nothing's beyond your pay grade. I was going to say because you get paid well. So you know, uh, but uh, uh, very well. But the the idea um, uh, and I appreciate your honesty. But uh, do you think that in in general though the dairy people are aware that you know I mean it's I'm not just producing milk you know for the guy at the you know at the grocery store you know it's uh, you know people realize and exactly because of those things that you said because of genetics and because you know that's an international market obviously correct what do you what, what do you mean that the milk export if the milk is an international no no no, no, no. The, the 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 what you're involved with you know with genetics is that's an international market in itself yes some yes it is yeah it, so it it's is. It's something that, because I recall when the Secretary of State of the, from the Azores of, of, of Ag was here, uh, you made an explanation uh, uh, actually at the, at the bank where Linda uh, works that, um, you know, and you talked about how, you know, how the, you know, some of these companies have presence, not just here in the United States, but even in the Azores, in Portugal, in Brazil, and, you know, so, so this evolution of Ag is kind of, the dairy industry is kind of felt everywhere, it seems like. Yes. The only thing I would have to say is uh, to, to your question that you asked me is that here in the United States, it becomes a little bit tougher because uh, we actually pay our workers or not we farmers actually pay their workers a very good, a fairly good wage for the most part. And when you're talking about China and, 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 and India, it's pennies on the dollar, if not even less than that. And that makes it extremely tough to compete in, the, in a world market like that. Uh, but when it comes to cheese trade and stuff like that, I don't really have an answer for you sure, on that. Sure, sure. No, and I don't want to go there anyway, uh, <laughs> because I, I wanted to talk about, you know, when you talked about well animal well-being, okay, that's one of the areas that you're kind of, you know, that you focus on when you yes. are consult with a different dairy business, you know, and, and uh, you know, how... Um, how does that portray? How is how is that being uh, interpreted by the dairy 
you know, today than they interpreted, for example, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And, and even internationally, because, you know, I mean, you know, we all see those beautiful pictures of the cows in St. George and, uh, and even in Terceira, uh, but especially in St. George, because they have lots of them. And so you see those beautiful pictures of the cows in St. George and all of the islands of the Azores, and they're pasturing out there and they're free, yeah. and, you know, they're looking at the ocean and you say, now these are happy cows, you know. So how do you, how do you turn that around and say ours are happy cows as well? Well, um, so I have, I, uh, I've been lucky that I just had a dairyman build a brand new facility that I work at. And I'm pretty sure I would rather sleep in those cows beds than in my own 10 year old mac mattress. Uh, I mean, the amount of airflow that they have going through there, the, the way they can keep the airflow going through the, the, the comfort of the actual beds that they lay in the cleanliness of the facility and the temperature control of the facility is just awesome. Um, and it, they're always getting fresh feed and they have plenty of water. Uh, genetically though, uh, how we've progressed, um, you know, back in the fifties, I would say, uh, basically it was two plus two equals four. If this cow gives a lot of milk, her, you know, and then I get a bull out of her, well, that bull's probably going to give a lot of milk. And all they were really concerned about was milk for the most part. So if you look at, uh, graphs, uh, from the fifties till now, you see a huge increase in milk. But there's things that you lose when you do that. Fertility is one and health is another. And now with genetics, uh, with genomics, I should say, we're able to identify these animals that can do everything. So they're, they're able to give a lot of milk, but they're able to keep uh, what we would call a uh, body condition, which is the, you know, sometimes you see those real skinny animals. Well, genetically we can pick for an animal that's not going to be that way they're going to have a little bit more flesh on them so that they're able to breed back and and we're actually starting to see through genomics now that that uh through genetics we can actually control how healthy these animals are so it's uh, it's a really cool time right now uh some people still haven't jumped on board with this uh with this genomic stuff but i see it being a huge factor here in the next uh, 10 to 15 years, we're going to see the dairy industry become more efficient. We're going to get more pounds of milk per, per, per animal. And, and also the amount of feed it's going to take to produce this milk is probably going to decrease through this uh, uh, isolating these, gen these animals that have these genetic traits. Um, so, yeah. So, if I may, please. On that animal health thing, I've used a, what I call a math equation to try to explain it to people that are not familiar with the dairies. If the animal's under stress of any kind, heat stress, water stress, nutritional stress, whatever, it's not going to profit physiologically. It's not going to produce enough milk or eggs or whatever you're trying to produce from that crop. So it's in the farmer's best interest, the dairyman's best interest, to keep that animal as comfortable as possible and eliminate all forms of stress. That way, it'll profit physiologically, and he will profit financially. Oh no, it's well, that's one hundred percent true. And I mean, yeah, these animals—they're not pets. I mean, they're still a commodity, but these animals are taken care of way better than what most people think. I mean, they are taken care of extremely well. Better than better than I get treated here at the house. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Even 30 years ago, I knew if I did something bad, or 40 years, if I did something bad and there was a sick cow, I got to live another 12 hours. <laughs> uh, and uh, Linda, uh, I'm sure you get treated well at home. If you don't, uh, let us know because we'll take care of Matt for you. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, a little bit about, um, you know, the, the financing in, in all of this. I mean, you know, uh, as Michael said, we, we, you know, the, the, there's a there's a movement to make a, the dairies, of course, more efficient, more humane. You know, as uh, you know, right. in, in the eyes of everyone. Uh, with uh, with Mel just explaining, you know, the, uh, with the uh, with almonds and and the other aspects of act. Um, how does financing itself? How has it uh, changed, or how will how do you see it? You know, playing a role in and obviously, you know, supporting the farmers, the dairymen. Sure. So I kind of wanted to touch briefly a little bit on what uh, Mel was talking about with the supply issues. Um, I think during this pandemic is definitely brought to light that, you know, there are some supply is issues in the dairy industry, right? Um, we had, you know, it happened right around spring flush, right? When cows are producing uh, 
probably their highest. And, um, you know, we had dairies that had to actually dump their milk. Um, and then you, as a consumer in a grocery store, you weren't able to purchase milk or you had, lim you know, you were only able to purchase one or two gallons or whatever the restriction was. So I think there's definitely some supply issues that came to light um, in that sense, but also too with this pandemic, right? Um, you have your consumers going to the store and they're wanting like proteins, milk, eggs, cheese. Um, and so hopefully that has kind of shed a little bit of light to the consumer of like, hey, that these are essential products, um, you know, and the consumer, they want transparency, right? They want to know where their products come from. They want to know that their animal, the animals are treated well, what kind of, you know, conditions, et cetera. And I think the industry, the ag industry, you know, still has a lot of strides to go in that sense, because unfortunately we have all these, you know, kind of fake milk products out there, um, that are competing against, you know, uh, cow products and so it, it's kind of is what it is but um i think we have a long ways to go in that sense um so just wanted to add a little bit of two cents um on that topic we didn't target dairy we targeted soy yeah <laughs> <laughs> we use both milk here at home so we use uh, cow milk but we also use uh, uh, uh almond milk so we we, we we support both here at home um uh I have a few questions that were asked by folks, and I want to encourage those who in attendees and those in social media as well. It's harder for me on social media uh, to monitor that, but I'll try to look as much as I can. But those who are attendees here on the Zoom uh, webinar, please do feel free to ask questions, and we do have a couple of them. And so here's one question. Uh, it says, super curious to learn how Central Valley farmers, dairymen, are adjusting to the environmental changes due to uh, climate change. So... How are some adjustments? I think Michael touched upon that a little bit when he touched upon how, you know, they might be making some more money, you know, in a different way than, the, than their milk products. And so how, uh, how is the industry um, or industries dealing with that? And we'll, we can start with uh, whoever would like to take that question. So I actually went to a, um, what would you call it? Um, a seminar about this. Mm -hmm. So, um, Without getting political, the earth, the earth is warming. Now, however you want to decide that, that's up to you. But the earth is warming. So um, one of the forecasts was that in 50 years, a lot of the people here in California <coughs> from the Central Valley will be moving to the North Midwest uh, because they're going to be able to uh, double, uh, uh, triple cut uh, crop. They're going to be, or what, a double row crops instead of single like they do now. And um, so that's what they are claiming. Whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. Okay, and, and what are farmers, what are dairymen, you know, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things, you know, of, of using solar, and I think uh, Linda mentioned that as well. Uh, so what are some of the things that, uh, that are, I mean, totally different today than what they were, you know, 25 or 30 years ago that, that dairymen are doing, you know, to, to other than the efficiency, are they doing other, other uh, uh, other 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 areas that they're using to kind of um, you know cut down on their on their costs of, of uh, well, that they have to pay for you know for these goods as well you know yeah I mean they're basically using their same footprint that they have right and they just have to become more efficient um, is basically what the bottom line is so whether it be solar methane digesters um, you know, whether it be retrofitting, uh, you know, their milk barns, um, their corrals, um, you know, I mean, eventually we'll probably get into robotics um, when that becomes cost efficient, but it's basically using, you know, your same footprint that you have and becoming more efficient because uh, unfortunately, you know, not any more land is going into ag, it's actually the opposite. So um, it, it's, and, and, the population is growing and growing. So, you know, in order to sustain kind of the, the need for the world, uh, it's just becoming more efficient with what we have. I'd like to point out to groups of Please. growers, you know, climates do change. I'm not going to get into the discussion about human influences, but climates change. And you know, Yosemite was cut by glaciers. I, I just tell farmers, deal with it, because usually this is the response I get. So Yosemite was cut by glaciers. Uh, in the almond industry, 
we depend on fog to help us clean up the orchards in the winter times or winter sanitation because you need that moisture to get those mummies out of the trees. We don't get the fog like we used to when I was a kid. I mean, it's just not happening. Actually, I had a, a, yesterday was kind of foggy around here. It's kind of nice. Uh, so in, in our industry, we're getting less chilling hours. Uh, and fortunately, we don't require as much as other crops. Several years ago, I've seen cherry orchards and pistachio orchards did not have one fruit or one nut in them because they didn't have enough chilling. But we're seeing impacts. We've got a couple of varieties that are acting weird and we're thinking it's the accumulated, excuse me, accumulated lack of chilling. And another, oh, another ahead, thing about the, the, the dairy industry is that we're an industry that uses a lot of byproducts. So we're using almond shell for bedding, almond hulls to actually feed the cows. I mean, we use uh, oranges that, uh, that go through the line that aren't that that we're not going to be able to consume because they're not pretty enough. I mean, all this stuff is all consumed by dairy cattle, and it's actually becomes a really good feed. So what do you do with this stuff if we're not able to feed it to cows? You're just going to dig a hole and just dump it somewhere? Um, linked. We need uh, a that's true. Yeah. There's a lot of great things that dairies do, especially for the environment, right? Because of the we're able to use byproducts. We're able to recycle water. We're able to use manure to make methane gas. We're almost every dairy, not almost every dairy, a lot of dairies are on solar, which probably covers the whole dairy. So th th this, this, this stuff out there about ag, it just drives me nuts that these people, they just don't understand what's going on. Okay, taking that. Is there a perception problem? Because, you know, like Mr. Mich Ms., uh, Mike Mail said a few moments ago in, in, in the early outset, you know, is there a perception problem that uh, is there the do, do dairymen and as in maybe not individually, but is that an association? And the same thing with almond growers and all of the other ag related fields. Do we have to do more uh, to uh, put out the information uh, to the general public, whether it be throughout California or New York City or anywhere else. Uh, how do you all see that? And we'll start with Mr. Machado. How do you see that, Mel? Absolutely. Good news doesn't make headlines. Bad news does. Uh, we're the lar In the almond industry, we're the largest single pollinating event in the world. We consider that with a point of pride because the bees, that the almond crop is the first crop the bees see coming out of the winter. And we literally grow the population of bees in those hives on the benefits they get from almond pollen and nectar. But you've got media outlets like The Guardian that says they're sending the bees to war. Nobody's gonna tell our story, we have to. And that's something that farmers don't like to hear. I wanna farm, I don't wanna go to town, I don't wanna have, actually when you do get a farmer to go to town, a good friend of mine put this up one day, if I can get a farmer to go to town, to Sacramento, he wants to be Babe Ruth and call his shot, slap that sucker out of the park and go back to the dairy or back to the farm. That's not how it works. Because the opposition, and I don't care which organization it is, the opposition is there doing this to you, poking at you, picking at you every day, just trying to wear you down. And they count on us in agriculture to, excuse me, eat our young. And we do, because the rutabaga guys just know that the, the artichoke guys have got something on them, and, and the dairy guys know that the almond guys are trying to mess with them. So we <laughs> eat our own young, fighting among ourselves, and the other guys win. Yeah, that's, uh, imagine, that's, and that's very Portuguese, as a matter of fact, we talk about the islands, you know, one island eating over the other island, yeah. uh, and, and Michael, in, in, in the dairy business, so you, do you think that there's, a, you know, this perception issue also, so do dairymen in general, not just individually, but also as an association need to do more to bring out these stories? That's a tough question. I think we try to do a good job but I think uh, Mr. Machado is accurate that uh, people want to see bad stuff, right? So if somebody's hitting a calf over the head with a hammer, that's what's going to make the news. It's not going to be my daughter running over there to her little baby calf and petting it and licking and having the calf lick her. It's just not going to happen. So it makes it super tough with that. And I think most dairymen are so concerned about their facility and their operation that they want to deal with, you know, they want to do what's best for, for their operation. And, and they, they're so smart and they want to concentrate on, on their operation. I don't know how much 
I don't, I don't know the answer to how much they can, how, I don't know that, I don't know that answer. It's just, it, it's a tough question to answer. Well, I, I think the, the consumer and kind of the general public is, is misinformed, right? So I think education is probably the, the key that's lacking here. Um, and two, just starting to teach kids young, right? Like what, what are these farming operations? What are dairies? Taking them on field trips, um, you know, providing school lunches, right? That have dairy products and, and different kind of ag healthy uh, products, I think is, is kind of the way that, that we have to continue, right? Is ed starting education from a young age. Um, Otherwise, the consumer is just misinformed. They just think that all these products are at the store all the time, and that, that's what they learn to expect. You know, yeah. they have no concept of where they come from. Have you ever done a Google search for milk and see what comes up that's positive? It's crazy. You do, yeah. you do a Google search for, for dairies or milk or, or any of that stuff. And, and well, and the, and, and the nutrition, even just the nutritional value, right? If you compare milk to these other products, almond milk or this and that, I mean, the nutritional value, it, the facts are the facts, right? Uh, you know, just from that standpoint, it, it's a healthier product compared to some of the others, but it, the consumer is just misinformed. Yeah, I just, I don't know how much effort and how much time it, it would take to be able to control some of that stuff that goes through the internet. I don't know, how, I'm not that intelligent. But anytime I try to type in any dairy stuff on Google, the top 10 searches are, are like, oh my God, you're gonna die of cancer if you drink milk every day. Our, our reality is, and I go back to my grandfather who told me, don't ever get in a spit and match with somebody who owns a newspaper. If you own one of these, you are now a publisher. That's true. If you own a cell phone, you're a publisher. And the stuff that gets reported out there, that gets written and gets accepted as fact when you don't know the position of the writer and what they're trying to convey, they're trying to convey their sentiment and get you to sway their way. And that's, that's what we're competing against. So that's why I say we as agriculturalists need to step up ourselves. Indeed. Yeah. Now, nowadays, uh, everyone can be a reporter if they want to. And so, and, and maybe, and maybe that one area, as you mentioned, Michael, you know, the, what's going to get the bad news is what's going to get exposure as uh, both you and, and Linda and Mel mentioned. Uh, but maybe we need to get more videos uh, of your daughter petting her uh, baby calf. No, I'm serious. I think, I think, you know, the simple things that, you know, you do and then you put forth, you know, will have an exposure. It may only reach 10 people the first time, but it may reach 150 or 2000 the next time. Uh, we have a lot of questions and we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go from question to question. And uh, if uh, anybody can take it, the, well, the first question was, or one of the questions on here is how has urban growth and uh, uh, suburbanization affected the ag industry and the dairy industry uh, in the Central Valley. So how has this urban growth, how these urban sprawls, all these, uh, you know, these housing projects and everything else, how has it affected the ag industry and the dairy industry in the Valley? Anybody like to take that on? It's not I mean, an easy question. For it's me, not an easy question. <laughs> it's not the Bay Area population into the Valley who, they don't like the smell, they don't like the noise, they don't, they don't like anything about it. Uh, so it makes it tougher to farm here and you have right to farm laws, but when they call the sheriff department on you, you still got to deal with it. It just, it makes it tougher. Okay. So it has affected uh, obviously the dairy industry and, 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 and ag in the central Valley. Um, another question, and this one is directly uh, directed to, to Mel, which is uh, basically um, how, um, uh, what is the five-year outlook for the almond prices Mel? So you're the expert. For the next three years, it'll be tough. You've got, uh, depending on how many acres we pull out, in the last three years, we haven't pulled out more than 40,000 acres because the price has sustained some of the older orchards. Those prices no longer sustain those old blocks. I know there's 135,000 acres coming in as new bearing next year. If we pull out 60,000, that's another 75,000 net. Uh, you could do that for three years in a row. That That is of a, a bit of a beast to feed. And what I'm saying is you, you're gonna have increased production just because of the, the acreage that are driving things. In times of ample supply, we get a history of double digit growth. Even with 10% growth, just barely double digit, uh, our carryouts will be larger than they should be. The carryout is unsold going from one marketing campaign to the next. I'm comfortable with 15 to 20% of shipments as a carryout. This next year, we're looking at 25 to 30. Uh, and then a bigger crop on top of that, 
history says three to five years of, of uncomfortable prices before we work our way through it. And uh, this question, I think, could be for all, all of you. Um, how uh, will uh, increasing uh, automation impact the dairy and the ag uh, industries in uh, the next 10, 20, and even 30 years? Kind of hard to maybe look 30 years, but maybe 10, 20 years from now. Uh, you've seen what has changed in the last 10 or 20 years. So um, what, how will increasing automation impact the dairy industry, Michael, from your perspective? You talked a little bit about that already. I think it's still a little ways away. Uh, I don't think the cost is quite there yet. And a lot of these, a, a lot of these dairies, even though they are big, they do like, I mean, they're, they're family owned businesses and they like, and they support a lot of people in the community. I just don't see uh, automation being here for another 10 to 20 years, maybe is my, is my guess. Uh, I just think for the, for, you know, for, for the workers, for the amount that they pay the workers compared to a, like, let's just say an auto uh, robot retrofit barn and everything. It just, it's still not there. So you see, you see it's at a slower pace it's at, com coming, it, coming, but at a slower pace. Yeah. And uh, Linda could tell me I'm right or wrong. I don't, I don't, sure. that's just she my, will. no, I, I, I agree and, too. And, and, and she'll and, enjoy and, saying whether you're right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I absolutely agree. Uh, I, you know, and I think with the labor issues, I think the lack of availability of labor in this industry is is increasing. Um, that on top of right, like you know, increased minimum wage wages and and all these extra things that benefits that the the ag employers have to pay for. Um, you know, we're going to see that grow, and you know, and with that comes some sort of automation, right? To, to where you're paying for less labor and um, just so you can bring your costs down. Um, I think we'll continue to see that. And Mel, how do you see automation in the wallet? Uh, I mean, in the uh, almond and, uh, and generally in that? We uh, are already in the net industry, we're already highly, highly mechanized. Uh, so we're there. What I see isn't so much an increase in automation in the agricultural side, I see it continuing on in the processing side. If, if I could show you our plants, uh, the technology in there is amazing. So what I see on the, on the agriculture production side is not so much automation as it is tech. Uh, it's everything from remote sensing, uh, uh, in-tree uh, moisture uh, monitoring status, all the different things that go on with from satellite to implanted instruments in trees or in plants. That's where we're going. Wow, quite interesting. And a lot of people are working on it. Yeah, well, satellite, that's interesting. And uh, um, so our last question that I'm going to ask each and every one of you is actually has to do uh, with the college. Um, and it's a wonderful question. And, I can, uh, and it's actually from Alcidia Freitas, uh, who is uh, at One Foundation. And um, what advice would you give college students uh, who are majoring in agriculture today. So all three of you, you know, uh, majored in agriculture in one way or another. And so um, we'll start with Mel. Uh, what, uh, what advice would you give college students who are majoring in ag today at, uh, whether it be at Fresno State or any other university, but hopefully they'll all go to Fresno State, including, including Michael's daughter and everything else. Good, solid production background. I think that's important. If you're one of my pet peeves, in fact, I had to come off of a Another webinar with MJC up here in Modesto. One of my pet peeves is ag education majors that, that don't know the pointing into the tractor goes in the field first. You need, you need to have a good production background as well. Uh, for me, uh, it, it's going to go back to the tech. Uh, grab onto the tech. That's where I see agriculture going in the plant world. And, and eventually also in, in the dairy world too. I, that's, I see the tech thing is no, no doubt. Whether it's microelectronics, remote sensing, all of that, that's where things are going. Michael, what would you tell these uh, young college students who are majoring in agriculture today? What would you tell them? So for me, and I tell this to a lot of people, I think everyone wants to be so perfect. Don't be afraid to fail. It's okay to screw up. It's okay. That's how you learn. And and sometimes you want to be so perfect, and that should, you'll never learn that way. I mean, I have a good friend of mine that I've been working with for years. About a year ago, he told me, I told, asked him a question and he goes, Mike, don't ever tell another dairyman that question. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And you have to take that. 
and take that criticism and don't be scared to do something wrong because that's the only way you're going to learn. Good advice. Indeed. Indeed. I don't know if Fatima would give that advice, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's why you're smarter than she is. Uh, Linda Pajeda, Linda Souza Pajeda. Yeah. Advice. So, so I guess nowadays, um, there's probably fewer kids that are actually growing up on farms or dairies um, that want to get into ag. So you're, you have this situation where, where you're not growing up in that environment. And I think kind of my advice would be to get some experience, right? Whether it be get an un, an unpaid internship, um, you know, uh, do something like that for the summer where you're just gaining that experience because, uh, you know, we see a lot of resumes and things that come in and you're, you know, fresh out of college and you have zero work experience. And so I think that's a challenge, right? Um, you know, as an employer uh, to hire somebody with, with any experience. So take a leap, don't get paid for a summer or two, you know, take, you know, um, take advantage of the internship opportunities that are out there. Um, it don't, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful panel. Uh, I appreciate your expertise. I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, I promised you we'd keep it to 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we're about an hour and 10 minutes, so that's good Portuguese time. We're still uh, on task. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, again, thank you all so much. I appreciate uh, your insight. I think it was wonderful. It gave uh, a lot of different information in such a short amount of time uh, to everyone out there and um, to all of you attending. Uh, again, thank you to all of you following us on social media. Thank you all as well. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mel. And thank you, Linda. Thank you. Uh, and uh, have a great uh, Thanksgiving and a wonderful Christmas season as well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you.